when the Buddha talked about tranquility and insight, he wasn't talking about techniques. He was talking about qualities of mind, qualities that we all have to some extent. The problem is we don't have enough. That's why we have to develop them. And as we start out to meditate, some of us have more tranquility to draw on, others have more insight. And so we both build on our strengths and try to make up for our weaknesses. When you look at how the Buddha described breath meditation, you realize he's trying to have you develop both qualities at once. Tranquility is developed by settling in and indulging in the pleasure of stillness. Insight is developed by learning how to look at the process of fabrication. And when the Buddha describes how to do breath meditation in a fruitful way, he's trying to get us to do both. There was once when he mentioned to the monks that they should practice breath meditation. One of the monks said, well, I already do that. And the Buddha sounded a little skeptical. He said, well, what kind of breath meditation do you do? And the monk said, I try to let go of any concern with the past, let go of any hankering toward the future, and try to be equanimous to whatever comes up in the present moment as I breathe in and breathe out. Which sounds like the way breath meditation is ordinarily taught. But the Buddha said, well, there is that kind of breath meditation, but it's not the kind that's going to get results. And then he proceeded to talk about the 16 steps. That was his normal way of teaching the breath. And in all of them, he divides them into four tetrads. In all the tetrads, he has you try to settle in at the same time you're trying to understand this process of fabrication. To begin with, the body, the first tetrad. Be aware of short breathing, be aware of long breathing. Get a sense of how it feels in the body. Then be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, be aware of the whole body as you breathe out. Here he's talking about the breath, not just as the air coming in and out of the lungs, but the sense of energy flowing through the body. Getting this large frame of reference right from the very beginning is very important, because as you focus on the breath and it gets more comfortable, it's very easy, if your frame of reference is small, to blur out, to find yourself suddenly someplace else. It's almost as if to stay in the present moment you have to fully inhabit the body in the present moment. Nail your awareness down so your awareness of your hands is in your hands, your awareness of your feet is in your feet, your head is in your head. Because if your range of awareness gets small, it can very easily slip down the tube into the past or down the tube into the future. If it's too big to fit in the tube, it won't go. So establish this large frame of awareness. And then the Buddha says, try to calm down the process of bodily fabrication. In other words, the way you breathe. Here he's introducing you to one of the three forms of fabrication. Bodily fabrication is the in and out breath. Verbal fabrication is your directed thought and evaluation as you bring up a topic into the mind and then you evaluate it. This is how we create sentences in the mind. Ask questions in the mind. And then the third type of fabrication is metal fabrication. That's feelings of pleasure, pain, or neither pleasure nor pain. And then your perceptions. So those things have an impact on the mind. Perceptions different from directed thought and evaluation. The perceptions are like single words. They're not really sentences, like breath, or big, or short, or long. Those things remain even as you get past the first jhana. So you 
calm bodily fabrication in that first tetrad, you try to notice what kind of impact is the breathing having on your sense of the body. And so the word calming here actually relates to the word, same word for tranquility. But at the same time, you're trying to get to know fabrication. This is the Buddhist technique for bringing the two together. Understand, well, what is causing unnecessary stress in the body right now? What can you do to minimize that stress? And this is going to start connecting with the other forms of fabrication as well. The way you perceive the breath is going to have an impact on how you breathe. And the way you treat feelings in the body. All too often, if there's a pain in the body, it becomes a wall to your breath energy. You build up a little cocoon of tension around it, and the breath won't flow properly. So one thing to do is to perceive the breath in a different way, as something that can permeate through the wall of tension, and not be affected by it. Now, as you're working on the breath in this way, you find that you're also working on feelings. That list of sixteen makes it sound like you're doing one, two, three, four, five, six, and you have to go in numerical order. But what you really find is that you're working on many of the processes at the same time, simply that you're going to be focusing on a different aspect. When you shift your attention to feelings, it's very much connected with the idea that you're going to breathe in a way that feels refreshing, that feels full, so that you're not squeezing the breath energy out as you breathe out, and you're not dragging things in as you're breathing in. You allow the breath energy to have its fullness, to have its place. And you do this in a way that gives rise to ease, pleasure. Then you try to notice the impact that that has on the mind. This is where feeling plays its role as mental fabrication. The Buddha says you become sensitive to this process of mental fabrication. How do your perceptions of the breath, of the body, of where you have your awareness, have an impact on the state of your mind? And then the next step is to try to calm that impact, make it something you can settle into, to enjoy. At the same time, you're gaining a sense of how you're shaping your experience of the mind through the way you perceive things, through the feelings that you focus on or the feelings that you ignore, or how you relate to the feelings. What happens when there's a sense of ease in one part of the body? Can you spread it to the other parts? If it runs up against something that seems to be blocking it, can you let it slip around? Like smoke going around a barrier, or water going around a barrier. And then as you get more attentive to how these feelings and perceptions are having an impact on the mind, that moves you into the third tetrad. You're just aware of the mind, and then you're aware of what needs to be done? Is your level of energy down? Do you feel tired, lazy, discouraged in the practice? What can you do to lift your mind up, to give it a sense of gladness, a sense of well-being in the practice? This may involve the way you breathe, again, it may involve the way you perceive the breath, the feelings that you encourage by the different ways that you breathe. Or there are cases where you've got to put the breath aside for a time being and start thinking about things that give you more energy in the practice, that make you happy to be here. You can think about the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. How lucky we are that we have a teacher like the Buddha. How lucky we are that the, the Dharma is still alive. Think of the members of the Sangha, the monastic Sangha that you find inspiring. Or you can think about your own generosity, or your own virtue, the good you've done in the world, the bad things you could have done but you decided not to on principle. It gives a sense of your own worth, your own dignity as a person. It gives you a sense of competence that you can handle these things. 
when you find that it gives rise to a sense of well-being, then you can come back to the breath. That's when the mind needs more energy. There are times when the mind has too much and it needs to be settled down, made more steady, flying all over the place. What can you do to steady the mind? One is you can use that energy to be more precise in how you notice how the breath energy is going through the body. Go through each of your toes, all the joints of your fingers, all the little muscles in your face, all the little muscles in your ribs, the areas that you tend to ignore, all those little tiny muscles down around your tailbone. Get very precise and be very methodical. In other words, put more energy into your evaluation of what's going on. After all, you've got the energy. Put it to good use. Or you can think about the other elements in the body that you experience along with the breath. There's the earth element, the sense of solidity. It gives you a sense of being grounded. If your mind refuses to settle down, you might use some of the contemplations or recollections that are a little bit more bracing. Think about death. It could happen at any time. Are you prepared for it? Suppose the Buddha is right, you know, that death is followed by new birth because of the birthing habits the mind has all along. In other words, it grabs onto every piece of clinging and craving that can take it someplace. Now can you expect that the mind's not going to do that at the moment of death? Are you prepared that when you're feeling desperate, the moment you know you can't stay with the body any longer, that you're not going to just grab at whatever comes? There's a lot to prepare for. Are you ready to go? It could happen at any time, you know. Can happen without warning. A little blood clot wanders around, gets lodged in your brain, that's it. Gets lodged in your heart, gets lodged in your kidneys, that's it. Are you ready for that? That kind of bracing recollection helps settle you down and get you a little bit more sober. Realizing that important work needs to be done, and it's got to be done as soon as possible. You've got the opportunity right now. Let's do it. So you're using verbal fabrication, using mental fabrication, using bodily fabrication to bring the mind into a state of balance. The same with the last step on that tetrad, which is to release the mind. Releasing here can mean anything from simply releasing it from unskillful thoughts, all the way to bringing it to very subtle states of concentration, the things that are weighing the mind down. What can you do to let go of them? The things that are getting in the way of settling down, the things that provide extra tension, extra stress, even the body or the mind. What can you do to Think of them dissolving away so they're not a burden anymore. And again, this can involve the way you breathe, the, feel, the way you relate to feelings, the way you picture the whole process to yourself and then evaluate it. So what you're doing here is you're using fabrication to settle the mind down. And in the process you're getting more sensitive to the process of fabrication, seeing how much your experience of the present moment really does depend on your present intentions, how you shape things from the raw material that's coming in from your past karma. This is how tranquility and insight are developed together. And ultimately, they lead to that last tetrad where you step back from all of this and Realize that no matter how good the concentration gets, it's still fabricated. 
sitting for a long time in the practice, that's going to be good enough. But there will come a time when your sensitivities get sharpened. You start developing a sense of dismay or disenchantment around the concentration that no matter how good it's going to get, it's still just fabricated. It's going to end someday. What can you do to go beyond that? You notice how inconstant these things are. And from inconstancy you go to the sense of stress, to the point where you really don't identify with these things anymore, even in the best state of well-being that can be attained through concentration. As you develop this passion in this way, you begin to realize the whole reason you were fixing your food and was because you wanted to eat it. And when you get dispassionate for the food of concentration, you lose your interest. And that allows it to stop. And you don't replace it with any other intention. You give everything back. Instead of this constant feeding, 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 you let go of all things. You discover even the path you let go at that point. This is how breath meditation gives great benefits, as the Buddha said. You're developing both tranquility and insight at the same time. In a way that's really liberating. So we're not just hanging out in some nice, peaceful state in the present moment. We're here for strategic purposes to develop our serenity and tranquility on the one hand, but also to develop our insight and to approach the issue of being at peace in the present moment as a skill. I mean, it's one thing to hang out with something that's calming, but it's another to gain insight into how you're actually shaping your experience right now and how you can shape it more skillfully and what the limits of that skillful shaping can be. To the point where you thoroughly understand fabrication and can let it go. Because you've seen how good it gets and that it's not good enough. And the peace that comes from that is much different from simply hanging out in a pleasant place in the present. It actually takes you outside of time and space. That's where the actual deathless is found. to try to keep the Buddha's steps in mind, because they really are beneficial. They really do make a difference. They're not just a pleasant place to hang out. They are that, but they're more. How much more? You have to find by putting them into practice. <laughs>